Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Schlenkford. Good morning to you, Mr. Gabriel. And uh, I want to say that it's an honor and privilege to have you here with us. Last night we attended the concert at the Strathmore Black Violin. Kevin Sylvester, who's maybe the most renowned uh, violin player along with his friend, um, did a fantastic show. And uh, turns out that you gave him his first violin way back when, when he was about 10 or 11. Correct. Yes, indeed. And of course, his parents are Dominican. Indeed. Yes. And as we're here talking, and you're having a little bit of sausage and a little bit of OJ over here, you talk, you started talking about religion. And you're a scientist. You're one of the most distinguished scientists uh, in the plant sciences. Worked at DuPont and Jamaica Banana Research Board and this, that, and the other. And your mother was a very strong one of Christian faith. And as a scientist, I guess you had your questions. But as you say, as you get older, you're beginning to have a different view. What is that different view of religion or your concept of God? Well, Gabe, this is how it has worked out in my head. I know for a fact that there's a creator. All the logic points to that fact, because obviously the universe and the earth on which we live could not have been created by any other force, but by an entity that had the power to put all of these elements together. I have come to recognize that beyond a certain level of human understanding given by our intellect that was given to us by God, beyond that is mystery. So the religions that have a predisposition to go beyond the line of where the intellect can reach and want to go into a zone that it is not possible for our intellect to grasp. We cannot grasp, for example, the enormity of the universe. We cannot grasp why we are here. We cannot grasp what this God fully expects of us, except perhaps intuitively to recognize that we have to be our brother's keeper and as a species, and we're not the only species in the animal kingdom on, on the surface of this earth, as a species that we ought to do everything that it is possible for us to maintain our existence on the earth. Where I part with religion is when we look at the works, religious works of whatever kind, including the Bible, and begin to draw from that our own ideas about how the world ought to be organized and to think that we have the capacity and the power to do things which we do not know exactly what we are doing. For example, we can, for example, take up the matter of slavery. To some large extent, slavery had some genesis in books that were written by men who said they knew, they knew, that one race was superior to the other and that the, uh, the others were practically proximate to animals and therefore it was possible by that kind of reasoning, nothing to do with God, only to do with man and their concept of how will the world and society should be organized. Even today in our present life, we are using religion to try to create certain kinds of divisions. And I'm talking all religions, I'm not talking just Christian religion. The Muslims are behaving a certain way. And how are they being persuaded to commit the atrocities that they're committing? Because they think they have an inspiration from their leaders, which leaders say they have the inspiration from God. When I reach that point, as I said, where we are at a limit, I don't jump over the fence and go and, and assume that I know. Because we don't know. We believe. The trouble with belief is that it can drag you in all kinds of different directions. And as a scientist... Belief have, is not rational. It's well, not using the scientific method well, necessarily it, it, or exactly, reason. Exactly. The trouble with the belief is it can drag you into all kinds of different directions based on what you think are your own interests. Well, let me ask this question as yes. a scientist. Mm -hmm. Where do you find that convergence or that divergence from the scientific method which you are taught 
because you've got a PhD in, in botany, is it? At yeah, the University of Illinois. General science. I did chemistry as well. Yeah. I did physics and I did mathematics. Yes. So where do you draw, and you've always talked to me and taught of the importance of the scientific, scientific method, which is what has allowed for us to make enormous progress in the past hundred years. Aviation, going to the moon, nuclear fusion, mm -hmm. uh, medical science, being able to uh, map the uh, genome, the human genome and all those things. Where do you see the convergence or divergence from the scientific method and that faith that your mother and my mother had, or parents? Well, Dave, I, yeah. have, I have looked over this matter relating to the question you have posed very often. And what I have said to myself is, God, this creator, has put all of these things inside of our globe and the, and the, and the world on which we live. There is oxygen. There are electrons, there are, there's gravity, there's all this kind of stuff. And what we do in science is you make observations. And when you make the observations, you are then able to test the observation to see whether it is scientifically sound. And it is only through that process and the study of physics and all that, we are then able to figure out, because an electron cannot be seen, you know, but the God put it there. We didn't put it there. The atom is there. You can't God, see it. We don't, we don't see it. The God put it there. All of the, the physical things that are around us, seen and, and unseen, this is where science then goes and digs out the facts. And then on the facts now, you are able to build technology and knowledge and all that. So this is where I connect the creator and the intellect of man. And that is why... That's the convergence. That, the, that's where the convergence is. Because without that capacity, uh, our cranial capacity, to be able to observe and to draw scientific facts, we would not be where we are. I mean, a refrigerator. What is a refrigerator? Scientists have found out that there are certain kinds of things that can give a cooling effect to air. And... What is that particular property? Is it hydrogen? That, uh... No, no, no. It's um, I, I forgot. Well, I mean, we are free on. Yeah, yes, yeah, we are free on. But but all 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 of these things come out of the the science of physics that will tell you that anytime you have some gaseous thing and you expand it, it cools. On the other hand, if you try to compress it, it warms up. You see, yeah. you no, know, it is all of those things you see that science has been able to establish. Now, let me make another point about the science thing. When the intellectuals began to search for scientific fact, the religious people didn't agree, especially those persons who were looking at the globe, our Earth, and trying to figure out its relationship with the other planets which were visible. The religious people didn't think that this is something that scientists should go interfere with. Was it, was it, didn't the church turn against Galileo? The, the, the church turned against Galileo, yes. The idea was, well, look here, you know, if God has put all those things the way they have been put, it's not a good idea to interfere and try to find out what... But my concept of God is exactly the opposite, that God put the things in there and gave us the intellect to go and search and find. Well, what about the whole story of the Tower of Babel in the Bible, where... Man was trying to build a tower to yeah. go into heaven. Yeah. And uh, they were working assiduously at that yeah. task. And at some point in time, God just smashed, I think, the tower. And then the men started speaking in different towns. Yeah. They were confounded. Yeah. They were working as one team. Mm -hmm. But then when he smashed it, they all started talking in different towns. Yeah. And as a result of that, they could no longer cooperate in the mission of building the tower. Indeed. What Indeed. is the message? What is the, I guess, the parable? Well, the, 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 the message... Is it that we shouldn't be looking too much? Well, exactly. The message is exactly what I said before. We have been given the capacity to understand certain things, and there's a line. The trouble with humans is very often we think we, can, we have the power to cross the line. It's not a good idea to cross the line. When you get to that line, beyond that line is mystery. Leave it alone. That's my idea. Leave it alone. And don't build a set of... Um, uh, ideas and beliefs that you know beyond the line and then you begin to influence people now. You see this foolishness about the, the Muslims and 
telling all these young people nonsense about you're going to get how many virgins? 70. 70 how, many, virgins. how many virgins? 70 virgins. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how they got to the number. Well, 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 exactly. You see, it, this is where the business of belief is in conflict now with facts of life. You cannot go now and talk about 70 virgins and try to put it into the heads of all these young people that there is some incentive for you to go and kill people, including yourself. And when you do that, all of a sudden, you're going to be elevated to some place, wherever that place is, and you're going to have 70 virgins. I mean, I wonder why would you need 70 virgins? I well, mean, so. because... because Instead they, of one or five. Because or they, there has always been in all the religions a battle with this business that we call sex. Yes. And my concept of this sex thing, proceeding from the scientific thing is, you have, you're a male, you have these hormones, you didn't create the hormones yourself, you know. The God in the evolution of the species, Homo sapiens, put these hormones in men for them to have a certain behavioral tendency and put separate hormones in women for them to have behavioral tendency. When these two hormones get mixed up because of genetics and you get people going to homosexual, I am not condemning any homosexual. You know why, Gabe? Because when you are in your instinctual tendencies, driven in a certain way by your hormones, you cannot then go and blame the individual and say, you are sinning, you are sinful, because this and that and the other. Leave that alone. It's the same issue of mystery. I don't know why, why, why God should put the hormones there. And I don't know why God should have certain persons who come out genetically with this mixture of hormones. I don't know. So I say, we know the hormones are there. That is as far as knowledge will take us. The question of why it is like that, I say, leave that alone. But, but Dr. Schlenkman, isn't there a conflict between that which you say, which I understand, the mm -hmm. whole Tower of Babel idea is to maybe have us leave things alone that are mm -hmm. mysterious or that, that mystery. Yeah. And that quest, the human being has a very inquisitive nature. Indeed. We're inquisitive beings. Yes. We want to look at the stars. We want yes. to put things on the microscope. Correct. So how do you deal with that conflict of preserving mystery mm -hmm. and so on, yet at the same time giving full reign to that quest to find out, yes. to explore, to inquire? Indeed. Indeed. How do you deal with that conflict? Indeed. Well, the instinct and the drive to explore and to find is to be able to get a handle on the facts of nature that are of benefit to humankind. When you have got, as I said, I repeat again, when you get to the level where you want to put other interpretations on what you know, then you get into the, the belief category. That is where the trouble comes in. I we see. must be very careful not to jump too far. Yes. Because God never gave us this power to jump too far. I see. We are not God. Yes. And we should not regard any human being on the surface of the earth yes. as if they are God. Yes. And we tend to do that as well. Uh, go. Clayton, uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to let you know, so this discussion started because you had a book in your hand when I came down this morning to Indeed. the kitchen. Yeah. Sure, to put a book up so I can see it on the, on the screen. Certainly. Yes. Why, why did that book, because when you started looking at that, you mentioned your mother never told you about how she grew up her early days. Mm -hmm. And this is a book by Alberta Christian. Correct. Or mother, with yes. Esther Christian and myself helping her put it yes. out. And what did you find fascinating about that that led to our discussion this morning? Well, in the early part of the book, your own comments as well as Irvin Andres, there was a sense there that your mother had a faith in herself and she decided that that faith and that ambition and that determination to live a good life should be passed on to her children. That faith is consistent with what I am saying because this is an earthly ambition and an earthly adventure for her life and for the life of her children. I saw no evidence in there of your mother trying to go beyond the line. She was living well within the line. And that is what we all must try to do. Live within the line. Crossing the line is where the danger is. Because the minute you cross the line and you get into the kind of belief 
area and you begin to, to conclude and speculate about all kinds of things. That is where we get ourselves in trouble. And I see this over and over, and we have it right here now in this United States. It is a man, the President of the United States, who has very scant knowledge of science or anything to have to do with how science develops. But he has a lot of beliefs, and he is causing not only the United States of America, but he's causing the world a lot of concern. Let's take a classic example, the business of climate change. It is a scientific fact, but the President of the United States doesn't believe. He believes something else, you see, that has nothing to do with the foundation of science regarding how this whole thing occurred. Now, how do we know? We know that we have put a lot of carbon dioxide in the air. This is a scientific fact. Scientists know that there's carbon dioxide in the air. They know how the carbon dioxide operates. They know how the gases operate in the atmosphere. You put a lot of carbon dioxide in the air, there is an ozone layer up there that protects the Earth from the effects of intense um, insulation and from UV radiation and all that. The God put it there like that, precisely to protect the Earth on which we live. When we go tampering with these things and the environment, we are walking into trouble right there. And when the scientists say to us, wait, wait, stop, hold, pull the brakes, and we decide we're not pulling the brakes, then we get ourselves in a lot of trouble. And that is exactly what is happening right now. I, I, I want to say how much I appreciate this discussion. And uh, I want to conclude it by asking, because you know you're the president emeritus of the Dominica Academy of Arts and Sciences, the first of its kind online, which has done enormous work. What do you believe, in conclusion, was the value of creating that academy? And what I, role does it play now post-Hurricane Maria? I think, Gabe, the value is uh, consistent with what I have said, which is to assemble facts, never mind the fact that we are assembling the facts in a somewhat narrow sphere. That is to say, we are trying to bring facts to assist in development of our country, Dominica. But that lesson can be extended. And once we have... To the Caribbean, to the wider pre world? Pre precisely so, precisely so. And the academy was established to exactly do that. That is to bring facts together and to see how those facts could be employed in partnership with our Dominican people who are resident to bring about advances in education, in healthcare, in agriculture, in, in, in science and so on. And we have done quite a lot of that, but there is a great deal more to be done. But it will only uh, uh, materialize if we get the partnership and we get the um, convergence of the intellects, because I'm back on the intellect again, you see, because it's all to do with brain power. As I said um, before, the way you think, the Dalai Lama was correct, you know, the way you think and how you think in your head, the brain power that you have, it determines the actions you take. The actions you take then become your habits. Your habits then inform your character, and your character is your destiny. So when we start with the thinking process, there is a logic that goes to the point of what your destiny as an individual and your destiny as a nation. And if you have screwed up thinking, not consistent with the facts of life, your destiny is going to be equally screwed up. And that is where we are in Dominica. We have to be very careful, very careful. Doctor, I want to thank you for this discussion. We will talk about other things at another time and date, but I think it was very enlightening uh, because, um, you know, when one looks at faith, just coming back to the faith issue, uh, which all, also has to do with the intellect. Uh, when you see the lives of uh, persons like your mother, my mother, Correct. Alberta, what was your mother's full name again? Gladys Elizabeth Philip. Yes. They were people of modest means, uh, you know, modest station, but they had faith in themselves and self-confidence that they imparted to us. And that faith allowed them to overcome the vicissitudes Indeed. of life, the limitations Indeed. Of, 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 of their modest station yes. and inspired their children mm -hmm. to better. So uh, in concluding, 
uh, what would you say is the importance of faith in one's progress in life? Well, as I said before, again, following the Dalai Lama, it's what and how you think. And my mother was in that category. That thought process then determines the actions you take in your life. Now, if my mother and your mother didn't have those thoughts in their head about what they were going to do about their own lives, and secondly, their responsibility to their children, they would not have taken the actions they took. And we know ourselves, Gabe, that people who think incorrectly, they, their actions are dysfunctional. Sometimes not only dysfunctional for themselves, but dysfunctional for people who are close to them, including their family. And then beyond that, their actions can always become in their habits, be destructive to the society and to the community. So there is a lot to do with your mother and my mother and what they felt in their head that determined the actions that they took. And the actions that they took, they were able then to take those principles and infuse in their children to go in the same track. Because once you deviate from the track, you're going to be in trouble. Yes. Um, Dr. Schillingfeld, I think this is a very profound sort of this exposition of what it takes to succeed. That faith, basically, you're saying was a propellant, a fuel. Correct. Indeed. Almost a spur Correct. Uh, to uh, cause one to gallop in the direction of progress. And I thank you for being a man of progress and a person who has used his time on this earth to better the condition of humanity and the forward march of our community. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe.